Hi, I'm Deb Kimmett, and this is the Pandemic News Brief for December 21st, 2020. A shout out goes to the Massage Health Practitioners and COVID-19 Facebook group for calling some of this information to my attention. I also belong to various lists that provide overviews of the research that's out there as well. And so then what I do is I take that information and do a bunch of my own research. Um, I cover research that's caught my eye over the last month, as well as questions that came up during the pandemic check-ins. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice at the bottom of the slides is that I have an abbreviated source. There is a PDF file that accompanies the video that has the full citation in it. Tonight, the two major topics are vaccines and testing. And the big news on vaccines, we're going to start there. So the big news is that vaccines are starting to be approved and distributed in just the last week or so. The end's in sight, sort of. And I want to talk about that a little bit. But first, I want to clarify how these studies work. I've been hearing that there's a little confusion about that. So briefly, there are specific phases to the studies, and they're all about safety first and foremost. They just want to make sure that the vaccine doesn't hurt you. And it's about whether it works. But first and foremost is the safety. First, a vaccine is tested in animals, and then human trials consisting of three phases. In phase one, they test a very small group to see if there are any adverse effects, like whether they pop up or not, and whether there's an immune response, meaning that the body produces antibodies that will fight off the virus. In phase two, they give it to more volunteers while again checking for safety. It's in this phase where they fine tune the dosage schemes, like how much vaccine goes into a shot, how many shots there are, how far apart the shots are, and so on, even sometimes if there is a shot. So then in phase three, they recruit very large groups of people from different populations, such as sex, age, race, and so on. They then administer the vaccine using the dosage scheme that they figured out in phase two. And again, they're looking for problems. It's really in phase three that they can really determine the safety of the vaccine because when testing such large groups, uncommon adverse effects surface and statistically you get a better read on what the common side effects are. It's in this phase, phase three, where they can determine the overall effectiveness by looking at those who became infected. Remember last month, we talked about how they determine whether a vaccine is effective. And there's a bit of confusion about that. People think that the size of the trial is what's important. To a degree it is, but what's more important is the number of people who get infected and whether they were vaccinated or on the placebo. So how did they come up with those numbers? How many people do you study in those phase three studies? Well, it's all statistics. And in this case, you kind of work backwards. First, you figure out how many need to get infected to get a statistically significant result. Then you figure out how many you need in the trial to get the number of infected people that you want. But how do you figure that out? Well, the first number is based on statistics. The second number, the trial sample size, differs depending upon the study. According to an article in The Atlantic, vaccine trials normally run for a long time. So they can use uh, smaller sample sizes, around three to 6,000 people, because the longer a trial goes on, they eventually get the number of infected people that they need. But in the case of COVID-19, because time is of the essence, what they did was they estimated that they need to recruit a lot more people to speed things up, to get the number that they needed faster. So let's look at some of these numbers. After crunching the numbers, Moderna decided that at least 151 people in the study needed to become infected to tell whether or not the vaccine worked. Then from there, they estimated how many test subjects they needed to recruit to get those 151 cases. They decided it would take about 30,000, half who were vaccinated and half who received the placebo to get to 151 infected cases. In the end, they ended up recruiting 30,351 people to come up with 196 infected people on November 12th, 2020, which was their cutoff date. And it's likely that there will be more infected people by the end of the study, which lasts two years. When you look at this, it appears that the companies kept adding people to the trial until they hit that number of infected that they needed. And it would make sense that the number of infected would increase after that, after they stopped collecting people in the trial. And that's why the numbers are higher than those 151. I also read about that cutoff date, and I don't know where that number comes from for sure, but it's likely that... Uh, that uh, while they will continue to study everybody who's in the trial and uh, those who do become infected, I think they needed to set a cutoff date 
for those that they put in their report for that approval application. Pfizer, on the other hand, estimated it would take almost 44,000 people to reach their target of 164 becoming infected. Pfizer ended up giving over 41,000 people the two doses, so their number was lower in order to reach their 170 on their cutoff date in November. And again, as the two-year study progresses, more will probably get infected. As an aside, I need to make a correction here. Last month when I did my update on Pfizer, I reported the number wrong. Uh, it was 170 people who got infected, not 162 as I reported. I mistakenly reported the number for the placebo group, which was the uh, lower number in the study. So when you look at the actual numbers, there aren't that many people who were infected, but they had to study a lot of people to get there quickly. And I've put the chart in your notes for you to have. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that both Moderna and Pfizer asked for an emergency youth authorization to be able to distribute the vaccine before the studies end. Ba and they did that based on three months worth of da data. Uh, this is significant because it raises questions about long-term effects, how long the pr protection lasts. And these are two-year studies, so they're gonna continue to collect data. So we'll eventually know some of the answers to these questions. Let's talk about something else that happened this last month, is that Moderna actually reported something that happened in between the doses. Uh, the Washington Post reported it and about what happened between Moderna's two shots, and this is really worth exploring because uh, we get some new information from it. And remember what I said last month, Pfizer and Moderna are testing for infection with nasal, nasal swabs only before getting the shots. People in the study weren't tested for infection in the rest of the study unless they showed symptoms. In other words, both Moderna and Pfizer were testing for symptomatic cases because a person had to have symptoms to be counted as part of the study. And then the, through the rest of the study, they're doing a blood test, which we're gonna talk about testing a little bit later. So this will make more sense in a little bit. At the time I talked about this, not much was in the press about it, but then more and more reports came out that this was an issue. The main question was, could vaccinated people get COVID and be asymptomatic? Could they transmit the virus? I started seeing more and more commentators talking about this. So everybody was starting to affirm exactly what I'd been talking about last month. And I put two articles in the notes. Um, one is a New York Times article on why vaccinated people still need to wear a mask, which is basically what I said last month that that's gonna have to happen is that even though we're vaccinated, we're gonna probably have to end up wearing masks for quite some time. So according to the Washington Post, Moderna sent out an addendum to the FDA uh, and they actually reported some numbers concerning asymptomatic spread, which they could only do for what was reported between the two shots which is not much of a, of a window. And they could only do that because those were the two times that they tested people to see if they actually had COVID. So on top of this uh, addendum, I also accessed the documents for the presentation given to the FDA committee, whose job it is to decide whether to give Moderna early approval. And both documents provide slightly conflicting information, but since there's more data in the actual presentation documents, that's what I'm gonna go with. And here's all the data. But what are we looking at? So let's take a look at this in terms of good news, bad news. Let's start here, asymptomatic versus symptomatic infections. The good news is that we get a glimpse on asymptomatic infections. The bad news, it's only between the two doses that we get that glimpse, but not in the rest of the study, as I've just talked about. So that raises questions about asymptomatic infections that the study can't answer. And we won't know the answers until there's a whole lot of asymptomatic spread that's traced back to the study participants. Now, let's compare those who got sick, but were asymptomatic. 12 in the vaccine group and 37 in the placebo group. So here are the percentages. Since 75% of the infected were in the placebo group, this means that between the two doses, the vaccine had an effectiveness of 75 as compared to the placebo group for asymptomatic spread. This is good news because it's actually higher than the 50% that the FDA is requiring. After one dose, it appears that the vaccine may help prevent the asymptomatic spread of infection. The bad news is, is that there's a one in four chance it won't. And again, this data is that the protection lasted at least three weeks. We don't know what happened after this. So that's also part of the bad news. 
And based on the Washington Post article, it might also help prevent people from being carriers, thus preventing transmission. The bad news also is we don't have enough information to see whether it holds up over time. Since uh, they didn't continue COVID testing, we just won't know more until more data comes in. Uh, and we just won't know enough for sure yet. And so there's that piece. And then the last thing I wanna talk about here is just a little bit more complex. Remember how just a few moments ago, I talked about how asymptomatic spread was now being widely talked about, but when I brought it up last month, no one was really talking about it. Well, this is another one of those things that no one's really talking about. So bear with me here for a minute while I set it up. Let's look at these two numbers first. Of the people who got infected between the two doses of vaccine, the vast majority of them, 49 of the 52, were asymptomatic. Most of those people, 37 of the 52, were in the placebo group. That's the good news. It's telling us that the vaccine is doing its job on asymptomatic um, COVID. But that doesn't discount the fact that of those who got one dose of the vaccine, 12 times more of them were asymptomatic than symptomatic which tells me that while the vaccine is doing its job in decreasing infection, when the vaccine fails, we won't know that right away because most of those people could be asymptomatic. Okay, so here's a few caveats on that. We can't apply the stat to the rest of the study as what holds true early on may not hold true later on. And we'll never know for sure because they're not actively testing for asymptomatic cases. We may get a partial picture down the road as asymptomatic cases surface as a result of contact tracing or people get a PCR test because they were exposed. But this is a long way to say that this data tells us that even when vaccinated, asymptomatic cases are possible and may be more likely than symptomatic cases. Our major takeaway from this is that our masking and our disinfecting protocols are gonna have to continue from here on out until we get more information. And just a reminder, this does tie into what we talked about last month. Here are the two slides uh, last month that are worth reviewing. Um, first of all, that there's still a lot of questions. The vaccine may not do what we think it will do um, because we think, you know, our first thing is, oh, we've got a vaccine. It'll keep us from getting COVID and stop the spread. But really what it may only do is that uh, it may only protect us from getting a more severe case and we could become vaccinated asymptomatic carriers. And as what I've just talked about confirms, it may help protect us somewhat from that. But at some point, if the vaccine fails, we could become asymptomatic carriers. And this other slide from last month that talks about the outcomes is worth bringing back. Neither vaccine may protect you from getting COVID. If both of you are vaccinated, a COVID case may be less severe. So that if you're vaccinated and your client isn't, um, you might give it to them. You might give the virus to them, even if you're asymptomatic and vice versa, they may give it to you. And whoever the unvaccinated person is could get a severe case. So there's that topic. And just to review where we are with the vaccine, let's do a quick head-to-head -head comparison. Pfizer studied symptomatic COVID, as did Moderna. Last month when I talked about this, I said that it raises major questions around the asymptomatic spread of COVID. Since I talked about that, the popular press is starting to report on that as an issue too, um, that because they didn't do nasal swabs on people throughout the study, we don't know whether someone could catch and or transmit the virus and be asymptomatic. With Moderna providing some data regarding asymptomatic COVID, the edge goes to Moderna. In effectiveness, the edge goes to Pfizer, but it's pretty slim. Both require two doses, which is a wash, but the edge goes to Pfizer because you get the doses closer together. On storage issues, the definite edge goes to Moderna as the Pfizer vaccine requires extreme cold storage. But what's gonna happen here is that it's more likely that you'll see the Pfizer vaccine in urban areas as they tend to have the equipment to store the vaccine. Whereas Moderna's vaccine is more likely to go to rural areas as it only requires regular refrigeration. And as far as preventing severe cases, Moderna has the edge. The headline of an article in Science, the flagship magazine for the American Association for the Advancement of Science says it all, quote, absolutely remarkable. No one who got Moderna's vaccine in trial developed severe COVID-19, unquote. That's really remarkable that there was absolutely nobody. We, I reported this in the interim study, but it also held true when they put in their final numbers that nobody in the vaccine group got a severe case, which is, which is really remarkable. So that's a, that's a really good case, a really good thing. But both of them, it appears that both will 
uh, prevent severe cases. It's just, you know, uh, Moderna just gets a little egg, uh, edge because I do like that little goose egg more. And duration is about how long protection will last. That's the question. We just don't know. So that's a wash. We do have a little bit more info on Moderna, but I'm still going to call it a wash. And here's that information. Scientists working on the Moderna vaccine wrote a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine that was published at the beginning of December talking about new data that shows that the antibody levels are still high 90 days after the first dose. So that's good news. So that means it's likely that the vaccine is going to last at least three months. And again, since the studies are so new, we're only going to find out how long the vaccine works just before it doesn't. And since the vaccine is rolling out in stages, we'll have a few months notice. As far as which vaccine to take, that will be up to what's available and which one you want to take. That decision will be up to you. So that's all I want to cover with regards to vaccine. There's more information out there, but because no other vaccine is near approval or has been approved, I'll save that for later. Now, with regards to a couple of items, miscellaneous items, to set things up to talk about testing, I want to cover uh, a few quick facts. First, people are contagious up to 72 hours before symptom onset. More likely, it's closer to 48. And also, the CDC says that those with mild to moderate COVID stop being contagious 10 days after symptom onset. And as for critical illness, it's 20 days. So after 20 days, they generally stop being contagious. Yes, there are exceptions to the rule, but unless these outliers become the rule, this is what's normal. This is what we typically know in terms of that window of when you're contagious. Because when we talk about testing, it's important to understand that window. So on to testing. A question came up about testing and rapid tests and what I thought about using them. Well, I had to jump down a deep rabbit hole to really understand it all. So before I can really clearly explain it, you need to understand a little bit about what tests are out there and what they do. And what I'm gonna tell you about them is very generalized and very simplified. There's more detail and other information about these categories, but what I'm gonna tell you is what's most common or pretty simplified. First, there are three types of tests, molecular, antigen, and antibody tests. The molecular test is what we hear the most about. The most common molecular test is the RT-PCR or PCR test. RT-PCR is a, an abbreviation for a big long honking name that I don't think is relevant for what we need to know. Um, these uh, tests, the PCR tests, are typically done with a swab of the nose or throat, although a few collect sal saliva and results can, can come back the same day or take a week or more, uh, just depending upon how backlogged the labs get. The antibody tests are blood tests. These can return results the same day or in one to three days. And the same thing can happen with them is that um, there can be a backup in the lab. And antigen testing, which is commonly called rapid testing because results come back very quickly, within minutes, like 15 minutes. Uh, these can be done with a swab and we're hearing more about saliva and paper strip tests these days as well. But what do all these tests do? Let's look at the PCR test first. The test is looking for the virus's genetic material, namely RNA. And so it's a diagnostic test for COVID because when it detects the virus RNA, it shows that you are infected by the virus. The rapid tests are also diagnostic because they show you whether a person has an active infection. What these tests look for are viral proteins rather than RNA. On the other hand, antibody tests don't look for active infection because antibodies are the immune system's response to the virus. So the antibody test is a non-diagnostic test because it only indicates whether you've had the virus in the past or it only indicates past infection or immunity. Now, just to tie this into the vaccine trials, they're doing ongoing blood tests to check for antibody response to the vaccination because they wanna know whether the vaccine is making antibodies, but they weren't doing any diagnostic tests after the two shots. So you can see that they aren't testing for active infection, which is the issue that I've been concerned with. Uh, an antibody test does show that you've been infected by the virus in the past. And my caveat to that is that it's, that's true if you've not been vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine, because then it's going to show whether or not you have built antibodies too. But these antibody tests don't diagnose COVID, nor does it show you that you still have COVID. 
So those are the different tests. The question I was asked about concerns whether we should do widespread rapid testing as in an over-the-counter home test that doesn't take a doctor's prescription. And what do I think about that? My early answer to the question was that it was a moot point because there weren't any rapid tests available in the US that were made for home use and without a doctor's prescription. Uh, they are being used in health departments to help expedite testing because it takes too long to get the PCR tests back. But, and that's an only some of them. But um, these kinds of tests that are home tests and without a prescription are available elsewhere, just not in the US. But now there are more tests out there. Uh, there are several that do require a prescription and there's now one on the market that is an over-the-counter home test that does not require a prescription. And so I think it's important to take a look at what the difference between the tests are, a head-to-head -head comparison between the PCR and rapid testing, because both of those show active in infections, whereas the antibody test doesn't show an active infection. So in the popular press and in science and in the FDA approval process, they all talk about the rapid test as being less sensitive, that they don't detect the virus as well, that you'd have a lot of false negatives because when a PCR test gets run, well, they pick up the virus where the rapid test doesn't. So why is that? First, we have to understand that in being more, less or more sensitive, it's not a random thing. So for example, if a test is negative, it's not just a random thing that it was negative. Studies show that the higher the viral load, how much virus you have in your body, the more infectious you are. The purple line here shows your viral load over time. And with COVID, the highest viral loads are around symptom onset. So you're really infectious early on in the disease. Uh, it just really peaks out very quickly and then it tapers off from there. Most of what I'm going to talk about here is roughly based on a video with an interview with Michael Minna, a Harvard epidemiologist, and my interpretation of the video. So hopefully I have this right. The PCR tests pick up whether you have any virus RNA at all. It picks it up even if there's not enough of a viral load to be contagious. So they're detecting everything. So everything above that orange line is going to be detected by a PCR test. Whereas the rapid tests, what they do is that they pick up levels that are a little bit higher up, meaning that when the viral load's a little bit higher, when the person is most contagious during the beginning of an infection. So when scientists say that the rapid test isn't sensitive, it's not going to pick up tests in this range, that space between the two lines. So it's not necessarily random. Yes, sometimes the test is just going to be wrong. Either test can do that. But the idea here is to think about what you're testing for and why. If you're using the PCR test, you wanna know whether or not you're infected. If you're using the rapid test, you're using it to determine if you're contagious. And the rapid tests are best used at the beginning of a possible exposure. But the idea is to use the rapid tests on an ongoing basis so that you'll catch your infectiousness early on when you are the most contagious, which is that two to five days after exposure. Another way to say it is, is that the molecular test is more sensitive to find out if you're infected. And the rapid test gives you a better picture if you're infectious because the PCR test will de detect infection even if you're not infectious or meaning contagious. And that's one of the reasons why people who are, you know, 20, 30 days past, past their uh, onset and they're recovering, but they're still showing positive PCR tests is because they've got some of the virus still in them, but they're not contagious anymore. That's the difference between the, the tests. So that's really part of what we need to understand is that these tests are doing different things. But the question is, is it more important to test whether a person is infected or is it more important to test if they're contagious? I think both are necessary. I think we wanna know when we're infected and when we're contagious. The testing scheme is that you get a PCR test when you're symptomatic or when you've been exposed. The rapid tests are inexpensive and give an almost immediate result, whereas the PCR test 
It can take a while and sometimes it can take several days, which is not good for stopping the pandemic. It doesn't do any good to find out whether or not you're infected long after you've become infected. Whereas the rapid tests are immediate and are an effective way to catch people at the height of their infectivity and use it to stop the spread. That's really what the issue is here. And you'd use the rapid tests on an ongoing basis to catch if and when you're contagious, whether you're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. The rapid tests are being used in other countries and here by healthcare professionals. The idea is to take the test and turn them into a non-prescription available for home use test. The other piece is that using these tests is not a substitute for a vaccine. It's important that you get the vaccine. Uh, we don't wanna be trying to use testing to get out of taking a vaccine because we need to have both. There is some controversy around these home tests and here seem to be the major ones, which is that they're afraid that people will think, oh, I'm, I'm negative, so therefore I don't need to follow any of the sanitary protocols because I'm negative. Well, the, as we said before, with the rapid testing, it may show that you're not contagious, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not infected. You could still have COVID. Another one is that people might game the system, that they might try to get out of taking the vaccine. Uh, and the third one is that maybe they won't follow up with the authorities because part of the way of getting on top of the, the pandemic is to do testing, but also report it to the authorities so that that way they can figure out how best to uh, mitigate the pandemic in their areas. And so that's one of the concerns is that people wouldn't do that. So these are what some of the um, uh, healthcare people are worried about when you have these tests. But what's more important is, do we want to try to get people to change their behavior and not be out and about when they're infectious, you know, when they're most contagious? Most of the tests until this last week have been prescription only, and many do require reporting. Of the home tests that I looked at, Abbott and Delume, they both report your stats. One is prescription only, and that's the uh, Abbott test, and the Illum test is over the counter. But both cost about $25 to $30. If you're going to do ongoing testing, that $25 to $30 is just a little bit too much. Dr. Minna says that overseas, these rapid tests can be much cheaper, about $5 a test. So if we want to be doing this on an ongoing basis, the cost has to come down. I personally can see the point for reporting early on to know where the outbreaks are to tamp them down. But again, with the higher cost and the fact that there's reporting involved may mean that a lot of people won't take them. I mean, after all, we know how well the mask wearing thing is going, right? <laughs> so, so there's going to be people who are not going to, who may not take these tests if they're required to follow up and, and, and uh, report to the health department on this. So Dr. Minna is basically saying that these tests should be, that reporting should be voluntary, okay? That, that people, ideally you would want people to report and the other thing is, is that Dr. Fauci generally approves of the idea of at-home tests. One of the videos that I looked at that really dived into this issue had clips of Dr. Fauci saying, yeah, people should have tests that they can take at home uh, for these rapid tests that they can do on an ongoing basis. So what's the takeaway here? The massage therapist takeaway is that all testing is needed and that it's not a substitute for a vaccination. We need to have both. Secondly, PCR tests diagnose infection. They don't always diagnose contagion because a person can be infected but not infectious. And so what you would use them for is for general diagnosis and also when you're symptomatic or have been exposed to a close contact. So you'd use the PCR tests then. Then with regards to the rapid tests, since they diagnose contagion, they again can misdiagnose some infections. So you don't wanna rely on them completely if you're um, showing symptoms and so on, but you wanna use them on an ongoing basis to catch contagiousness. Screen yourself once or, time, once or twice a week and stop work if you're infectious. What you also wanna do is think about asking your clients to 
participate too. But you've got to be very careful because this is a scope of practice issue. We cannot prescribe. But if you talk about what you're doing to protect your client, then your clients might want to get on board with this too, because they might see the value of, gee, I want to go see my family tomorrow afternoon. And so I'll take a test tomorrow morning to see if I'm contagious or not, see if it's safe for me to go see them. And so then what they may want to do then is, well, maybe I take it, you know, an hour before I come in for my massage. Okay. And so then that way you're protected as well. So this could be a scheme that could be something that your clients might be interested in doing too. But again, this is a very scope of practice issue because we cannot prescribe. We can't tell clients what to do with that kind of stuff. We can only inform people of what's going on. And so you can also use these on a personal basis yourself to avoid exposing others if you're positive. And if positive, you want to use a different manufacturer's rapid test to confirm your positivity, to make sure that you are indeed infectious and not just getting a false positive. So that's testing. Well, that does it for today's news brief. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope that all of you have a really nice holiday season, and I'm sure that we're all looking forward to a better 2021. Take care, and again, thanks for watching.